Okay, open your Bibles with me uh, to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. As you're turning there, I'm going to conclude this morning. Um, the, it's turning out, turned out to be a six-part message. Uh, today is the sixth message in our first series of the year. And our theme for the year, come on, say it with me, is courageous. courageous. And in chapter 1 of Joshua, he mentions three times, verse 6, verse 7, verse 9, be strong and courageous. And then in chapter 23, at the end of Joshua's life, he reminds the people to be strong and courageous. courageous. We told you that our overall theme for this series and for the year for our theme, Courageous, is that being courageous is the key to living victorious and seeing the miraculous. I believe all of us should want to be victorious and want to see the miraculous. So our series that we began for the first part was called Why Courageous? We've done five weeks. If you've missed any of those five weeks, you can go to the website or go to the YouTube channel, get caught up on those messages. Um, Five reasons why God told the people uh, then and us today why he wants us to be and why we need to be strong and courageous. Now today I just want to put a ribbon around this gift of this series and just bring it to a conclusion And this morning, we want to put up on the screen, we're able to do, and we're going to try to put up on the screen the five reasons. Uh, I I don't want to take the time to go through them. I don't want to repeat the messages that we've had. But there are the five reasons and the five messages and reasons why. There was generational changes. Moses died. Joshua took over. There were natural circumstances. They had to navigate through the the rough terrain and the deserts and the mountains and etc. There were spiritual conflicts. There were the battle with the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, all of the ites. And then there was the cultural crisis of not bowing to the, uh, to the other gods of the land and, and not turning off of the straight path. And then there was last week we talked about the internal challenges of fear and discouragement. As God said, do not be afraid or be discouraged, but be strong and courageous. So that's a snapshot of the five messages in this series on why courageous. And again, if you missed any of those messages, you can get caught up. And I would encourage you, listen to them as a group because all five are key to the total of the series. Now, I want to, today, my focus is this. I want to talk about the overall calling. You see, we have generational changes, we have uh, circumstances, we have um, challenges, conflicts. This morning, I want to talk about the overall calling. I want to talk about the why behind the whys. Now, we looked at five whys, but how many noticed that all of those were problems? How many noticed all of those were things that we have to overcome? And part of the reason that God commanded them and wanted them to possess the land of Canaan was to overcome these problems and and that they needed to be courageous because of the problems of the land of Canaan. But how many understand God had a bigger purpose, an overall purpose, why he wanted them and commanded them to go into the land of Canaan? And what does that really mean for them then and for us today? What does it mean for us that possessing Canaan? I mean, we're not crossing over physical Jordan River and going into a land physically and actually uh, navigating and possessing the land, but what does that mean for us today? What's the why behind all the other whys that we looked at? And so today our key verse is verse 8. We looked at all the other different verses in those other reasons, and now verse 8 is the key verse for the why behind the other whys. Verse 8 says this, this book of the law. Now, how many know in those days they didn't have the full Bible, they just had the the books of the law. Moses is the first five books of the Bible that we have, which we call the Pentateuch. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's all that they had at that point was the law that Moses gave to them. And he said, that book of the law, which represents for us the word of God, shall not depart out of your mouth, but shall you shall meditate on it day and night and be careful to do all that is written therein. Notice this, then, and here comes the reason, here comes the overall calling of God for them possessing the land and what it means for us to possess the land and the why behind the whys. He says, then you you will make, notice God doesn't do it all, 
you will make, you will make your way to be prosperous and you will have good success. Say prosperous and say success. Now I want to submit to you today that the why behind all the other whys that God had for them was not just for them to overcome problems, but also God had a bigger purpose or an overall calling, and that was that God wanted them to prosper and to be successful. Now that may seem very shallow and very narrow, and, and some may have trouble with that, and you may get nervous with the words prosper and success, but how many know God told them? When you navigate through the land, you go through the generational changes and the natural circumstances, spiritual conflicts and the cultural crisis and the internal uh, challenges, the goal is for you to prosper and to be successful. That was God's why behind the why. Now again, don't get nervous that Pastor is talking about prospering and success. I know there are extreme teachings. I know there are things that people will distort. In scripture, but how many know the Bible says prosperous and success? Okay, so either we need to understand something or we need to learn something. But how many know God wants us to prosper? It's okay to say that. Now, isn't it interesting? This is the only time in the Bible that the word success is used. The only time. Now, what's interesting about that is that notice it's linked and it's connected to the book of the law or the word of God. What is it connected? It's connected to keeping this book in your mouth, meditating on it day and night, and obeying it. That's the key that links to prosper and success. Now, I know there are a lot of definitions that people have. If I went around the room or I went on the street and I said to people, what is your definition of success? How many know I'd get a whole lot of answers? And it would range from what kind of house they live in, the car they drive in, how much money they got in the bank, what their job or occupation or career path is. How many know there would be all kinds of definitions? And so we need to look at what did God mean? If that was his overall purpose, if that was the why, what did he mean by prosper and success? Again, it's connected to knowing, believing, and speaking, and Obeying the Word of God. And that's the key foundation we need to understand. Now, how many know success for Joshua and us today is not like some of the common definitions people would say today, in that success is not about possessions? Okay? How many know God didn't send them into the land and say, you're going to be successful because you're going to, you're going to capture a lot of real estate? I mean, no, that wasn't what the goal was. And how many know for us, the goal isn't how many blessings we can collect? Now listen, God's a blesser and he will bless us. I'm all for blessings. Anybody in for blessings? We're all for blessings, but how many know it's not about who gets the most blessings? It's not about possessions. It's not, well, I have this and I do. Listen. God's standard and the definition of success, biblical success and prospering, is not about possessions here. It's not also about power. How I many know that's another common definition of success? Is power. How I many know this wasn't for them to be on a power trip? You go into the land and your army and your nation is more powerful than all the others. How I many know it wasn't about power? And how many understand, it's not about us saying our religion and our church and our, our thing is better than everybody else. Oh, come on, how many know it's not, that's not success he's talking about? Not only is success not like the common definition of possessions or power, how many know it's not about popularity? How many know he wasn't telling them, you go into the land and you're going to be my favorite chosen people and everybody's going to love you? That wasn't the goal. And for us, it's not how popular we are. Oh, come on. How many people fill the pews? How many, you know, how, how, many, how many people? Remember, Noah had only a few people go in the ark, and they had to. They were related to him. See, it's not about 
popularity. It's not about making a name for ourselves. It's not how many likes you get on Facebook and how many followers you have on Twitter. That's not success, according to the Bible. It's not about possessions. It's not about power. It's not about popularity. Can I even submit to you that success in the Bible is not even about paradise? How many know for the people going into the land, they weren't going into a perfect life? Not if you're going to fight battles. People are going to die and get sick. Do you realize they fought battles in Canaan? People died. People got sick. There was sin in Canaan. I mean, no, that's not paradise. That's not perfect living. And listen, crossing over Jordan and going into Canaan for believers for us today is not dying and going to heaven. Now listen, I know growing up, and, and I, there were some songs that we sung, and listen, I love the old hymns. And I, I, don't, I love the new songs too. I love them all. Because I love to worship. Oh, come on. But when I was growing up, we used to sing a couple of songs that you say, crossing over Jordan into, into Canaan is heading to heaven's fair land. How many know that's not Bible? Crossing over Jordan and possessing the land of Canaan is not about paradise for, for a believer. That's not what it means to us today. Because how many know in heaven we're not going to fight battles? Heaven, there's going to be no sin. Oh. Heaven, there's going to be no tears. No pain. Thank God. So if success is not about possessions and popularity and power and paradise, then what did God mean when he said, I want you to prosper and be successful? Can I submit to you today that biblical success is not about possessions, it's not about power, it's not about popularity, it's not about paradise, it's about purpose. Purpose. And that success is finding and fulfilling God's purpose for our life according to the Word of God. You want to know what real success is? Is you find out what God wants for your life, you, and you go out and you obey it and you fulfill it based on the principles of the Word of God. That will make you successful and prosper. And blessings will be the bonus on top of it. Possessions and power and popularity and even heaven are all the bonuses on top of the purpose. That's what makes a person say when we find and we fulfill God's purpose in the Word of God. That's biblical say. So then I want to submit to you that the purpose that's found in the Word of God for all believers is twofold. Are you ready for this? I believe God's overall calling and the why behind the other whys and what it means to prosper and be successful was that two things. One, that God would teach them then and us how to live in victory. Say victory. victory. Prosper, the word prosper, if you look at the word study of that, and I went really deep on it, and that word prosperous in the Bible means going forward in overcoming power. Going forward and over. So when God said my purpose or my why behind the why is first spiritual victory. That's what God wants for us. He didn't want to capture more land. He didn't want to make Israel the greatest nation on the world. He didn't, he didn't want to, he didn't want to uh, make us to, to go to heaven. What is, it's all of, that's not the overall goal. The overall goal is for us to be victorious, to prosper, to go forward in overcoming power. And then the word success, if you look carefully at that word, it means this, growing up in character. And so I submit to you that success means maturity. So to prosper and to succeed or to have success means victory and maturity. That's God's purpose. That's God's why above all other whys. That's God's overall calling and purpose for your life and my life. That we would learn how to live victorious. How we would learn to live in victory. And how we would learn to grow up into maturity. That's God's purpose. That's what it means. Say prosper. prosper. Say success. success. Say victory. victory. 
and maturity. That's God's purpose. That's what it means. There, let me show you an Old Testament scripture. Many of you know it. I know some people, it's your favorite scripture. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans, the purpose I have for you, says the Lord. Plans or a purpose not to harm you, but to prosper you. To give you, what does that mean? To give you, say it, hope, hope. and a future. Say this with me. Prosper, right. success. Say victory, victory. Maturity. maturity. Say hope, hope and a future. Let me show you something in the New Testament. This is where I want you to turn, and this is where the rest of our time this morning is going to be. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. If you have a Bible, if you want to follow along in your phone tablet, those who are in home phone, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 to 11. I want to walk you through these verses as we wrap up and we conclude this first series of the year. Verse 3. 2 Peter 1, beginning at verse 3, according to God's divine power, say power, power. he has given us, notice he's given us all the things that we need that pertain or that are necessary to live in this life and to do it godly. Say, life and godly. Prosper, success. Hope, future. Victory, maturity. Life, godliness. Oh, do we see in something here? Okay, listen, look what he says. All that we need to live in this life, to live victorious in this life, and to do it godly or with maturity. And he goes on to say, through the knowledge of him, speaking of Christ, who has called us. Here's the calling. Here's the overall calling. Here's the purpose. He's called us to glory. What's glory? The word glory means fullness or the full weight of God or the fullness of God's victory and to virtue. What's virtue? Virtue means excellence or character or maturity. Oh, come on. Say glory and virtue. Say hope and a future. Say victory and maturity. Say prosper and succeed. Are you seeing the overlap of these words? Bringing into focus what real prosperity and real success is. Notice this. Whereby we have been given great and precious promises. Say promises. Notice we've got divine power and we've got divine promises. Remember all of the other five whys were problems, but how many know for every one of those problems there was a promise so that they could be victorious and become mature, so they could have hope and a future, so they could have glory and virtue. How many are following me? Okay. That you may be partakers of the divine nature. Notice Divine power plus divine promises equals divine purpose. What is that? To have, be a partaker of the divine nature. How many know that's maturity? Character of Christ. And having escaped the corruption of this world through the evil desires. Victory. Overcoming. Anybody see that? How many are with me? Wave at me. Come on. Talk back. Talk nice. Notice that. Notice it's twofold. Everything we need for life, victory in life, and godliness, maturity. Notice this. Everything we need for the promises that we need so that we're called to glory, victory, and virtue, maturity. We could be partakers of the divine nature, maturity, and escape the corruption of this world, victory. Then he tells us how to do that. 
Give all diligence to add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. What is the why behind all the other whys? What is God's overall calling for our life? It is for us to prosper and to be successful, which means victory and maturity, which means hope and a future, which means glory and virtue, which means taking on the divine nature, and it means escaping the corruptions of the world. Now, divine power, say power, power. plus divine promises equals divine purpose. That's the formula for spiritual success. How many have ever seen a math equation? Well, here's the spiritual math equation for spiritual success. God's divine power, which is in his word and in his spirit, who authored the book, the book. Remember, it's all about knowing the book, not getting it out of your mouth, meditating on it day and night, obeying to do what's in it. The divine power of God through the Holy Spirit and the word, plus God's divine promises, equals divine purpose, glory and virtue, nat divine nature and escaping corruption, everything we need for life and to do it godly. All of that is found in that. We need to, how many know we need to receive God's power? We need to believe God's promises, and then we can achieve God's purpose. Say this with me, receive, receive. God's power. Believe God's promises equals achieve God's purpose. You see, when we allow God's power and God's promises, we can achieve God. What did he say? I want you to go into the land so that you will make your way prosperous. God, you got to do it. No, you will make your way prosperous by learning how to be victorious and learning how to grow up to maturity. I mean, no, that's on me. That's on you. In order for us to achieve God's purpose, it's God, yes, with his power and his promises, his word, but it's us obeying that word and believing that word and knowing that word and speaking that word and living that word that causes us to achieve the divine purpose. A prosper. Let me quickly take you through the divine purpose of spiritual victory. I'm just going to give you these quick... Now, how many know you can't have victory without battles? That's why those other five whys were there, so that they could overcome and have victory over them. Here's what John 16, 33. In this world, you will have tribulation. There'll be battles and problems. But be of good cheer. I have overcome... The world. Romans 8, 31 to 38. What shall we say to these things? What things? The circumstances, the challenges, the crisis, the conflicts, all the stuff that we've... What do we say to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but raised him up for us. How many know victory and maturity is found in the fact that Jesus died and rose again? Spared not his own son, but freely gave us everything we need for this life. Who can, who can separate us from the love and the victory of Christ? Nothing. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, uh, uh, peril, the sword, threats, uh, fear. Nay, none of these things. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave him for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor any other thing can separate us from the love of God. What is God's purpose? He wants to teach us how to live and walk in victory. Luke, uh, 1 John 4, verse 4, and then chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. You are of God, little children, and have overcome. Because greater is he that is in you than the evil spirit that's in the world. For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes? Those who believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and is the Son of God. Now that's the divine purpose of victory. Let's look at the divine purpose of spiritual maturity. And how many know with maturity, it means there are going to be growing pains. Just like in order to have victory, there's going to be battles. And in order to mature, how many know there are going to be growing pains? And yet, God wants us to succeed with that. 
Luke chapter 2, 52, Jesus, who is our earthly example, increased or grew and mature in wisdom, which is mentally, stature, which is physically, favor with God, which is spiritually, and favor with man, which is socially. How many know God wants us to grow up and mature in all four areas? He wants us to mature in wisdom mentally. He wants us to, uh, to mature physically. He wants us to mature spiritually with favor with God and socially in our relationships with man and with others. Ephesians 4, 13. God gave some gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors. Why did God put those gifts and those leadership things in the church? Here's the purpose. For the perfecting, which means the maturing of the saints or all believers. How many know the purpose, the reason why I preach and teach and why pastors and why we have classes and why we do the things we do are there to perfect or to to mature people to grow up spiritually. We don't stay children and infants. We accomplish God's purpose of maturity. He says that the, all believers would become mature. Notice, so they would do the work of the ministry. Well, I thought the pastor does all. No, all of us do the work of the ministry together. We mature together. We do the work together. He says that the whole body would be edified till we all come into the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God unto maturity. That you know more, listen, the measure up to the standard and the stature of the fullness of Christ. How many of our maturity is not to be like this Christian or not to be like pastor? It's to be like Jesus. Up to the stature and the measure of him. He's the example of maturity for us. Be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Every message that comes along, every teaching that comes, everything, we run here and run there instead of sticking to the straight path and to the Word of God. He says, you don't be a child tossed to him. How many kids are easily led astray, easily deceived? But those who are mature won't be. He says, he goes on to say that we would grow up into Christ in all things who is the head of the body. Hebrews 5, 12 through chapter 6, verse 2. At this time, Paul was telling, or or actually the writer of Hebrews, some think it's Paul, some think it's Apostle, doesn't matter. Apollos, I mean, doesn't matter who it was, but the writer of Hebrews tells us this. At this time, you ought to be teachers, and yet you still need someone to teach you the basic principles of the Word of God. You still need milk because you cannot digest strong meat. For those who still need milk, they are unskillful in righteousness and remain a babe. If we just keep struggling with the same thing, we've got to realize we've got to start growing up and get weaned off of the milk in the basic things and start getting a little stronger and better in those areas of our life. And he says, he goes on to say, those who grow up and are able to digest meat the strong meat of the Word of God. If you can say ouch to something and say I'm willing to change my life, how many know that's maturity? Instead of just tell me something that will make me happy and hallelujah. How about tell me something that will change my life and make me grow up? How many know we don't like always broccoli? How many know we'd rather have ice cream? Ice cream will make you happy. Broccoli will make you stronger. The hallelujahs will make you happy The meat of the Word and the real teaching and the truth of the Word of God that changes our life will make us healthy and make us stronger. And what did the Bible say? In the last day, people won't want to hear sound doctrine. They won't want to hear teaching like I'm telling you today. People want, just give me the hallelujahs. I just want to shout and float. I mean, no, it's not about shouting and floating. It's about growing up and being victorious and not falling into the same patterns and traps and Growing up into Christ. He says, listen, stop. He tells us that that we need to grow beyond the basic principles and go on to maturity. Not arguing and struggling over fundamental doctrines of repentance and faith and baptisms and laying on of hands and resurrection of dead and eternal. How many know we still shouldn't be struggling over heaven and hell? We still shouldn't be struggling over whether I should repent or not repent. We still shouldn't be struggling over water baptism and baptism of the Holy Spirit. We still shouldn't be arguing and struggling over some of the basic teachings. People want to argue and fuss and struggle over that stuff. We should be past that and need to grow past that. That's God's calling and purpose for us. 
to go past that. Now, here's the bottom line. I'm going to wrap this up. Say this with me. Prosper and success. success. Say this with me. Hope and a future. future. Say this with me. Glory and virtue. virtue. Say this with me. Victory and maturity. maturity. That's the thread throughout the Bible that teaches us what biblical prosperity and success is all about. It's about purpose of victory and maturity in our life. Now, how do we do that? Here's the bottom line, and this is how we're going to wrap this up and wrap this series up and this message this morning. We build courage by building character. We build courage by building character. Notice God said, I give you the divine promise. I give you the power, right? I give you the promises so you can achieve the purpose. And then he tells us how. Look at verses 5 to 7 in 2 Peter 1 again. Here's how. How do we achieve God's purpose? How do we live victorious? How do we grow up to be to maturity? We do it by building character. Notice what he says. Verse 5, give all diligence. What does it mean, diligence? It means make your main priority. I mean, our number one priority ought to be the next things that he tells us. Put your maximum effort into these next character qualities and traits, is what he's saying. You want to live in victory? You want to grow up into maturity? You want to fulfill God's overall calling and purpose? Then give all diligence or make it your main priority and your maximum effort to, to get to develop these character qualities. He says... Add. Say add. How many know God doesn't want to take away? He wants to add. He wants us to add to our life. Add. Increase. Grow. Mature. Move forward to your faith. What does he mean by faith? He's talking about our overall salvation, our overall faith in God. We need to add and grow that and develop that if we're going to learn to be victorious and we're going to learn to grow to maturity. Add to your faith, and he gives us seven character qualities. And if we want to build courage, and we want to achieve God's purpose of living in victory and growing into maturity, we've got to have and make every effort and make it our main priority to develop these character qualities. He lists them. He says, add to your faith virtue. Say virtue. Now, the better interpretation of that word is the word excellence. Add to your faith excellence. In other words, don't settle for a Christianity that says it's good enough. Ah, it's good enough I go to church once a month. It's good enough I read my Bible once a week. It's good enough I hear a sermon once a week. It's good enough I pray when I can. How I many know it's not about good enough, it's about excellence. You want to live in victory? You want to grow to maturity? It's got to be better than good enough. Oh, come on. How many know we settle for good enough? And then we wonder, I don't understand why I have no victory. I don't understand why I'm not growing. Make every effort. What does it mean, excellence? It means do the best you can do. Always do the best you can do when it comes to your faith and your salvation and your Christianity. Give it your best. Now, how many know (laughs) it's not supposed to be half-hearted? all in. Now listen, God hasn't called me to be the best pastor or preacher or son or husband or uh, father or grandfather ever. (laughs) Although I have some cups and some mugs and (laughs) and some plaques that say I am some of those things the best ever. I mean, God's calling for my life is not for me to be the best preacher ever. But he has called me to be the best preacher I can be. When I stand before God, he's not going to say, boy, you were Charles, you're better than Charles Spurgeon. No, you know what he's going to say? You did the best that you were called to do. You 
Your calling is for you to be the best husband. Come on, somebody. My calling is to be the best husband. Your calling is to be the best wife you can be. Not the best wife ever, the best husband ever. How many know this is not a competition and a rank amongst ourselves and who's better? It's, not a, it's about adding to your faith excellence. And excellence in my faith is for me to be the best pastor I can be. That I can be. The best preacher I can be. You may not think every week, oh, that was the best sermon ever. But you know what? I can guarantee you I put my best effort into that sermon that week, whether you liked it or not. (laughs) I can tell you that, and that's what I have to answer to God. I gave it my best. I put my heart and every, and I did what you wanted me to say, not what they wanted me me to say, but I did my best, and then God will honor that. What, what does he say? Add to your faith excellence. Then he says, add to excellence knowledge. What does that mean? That means we should always be learning and always gaining knowledge, which leads to understanding and which leads to wisdom. How many know we should never be satisfied with what we know? Now, if God's calling for me is to be the best pastor, to be, how many know? I should always be learning what pastors should do. Anybody? I read articles about what pastors need to know. I network with other pastors who are, who are doing well or not doing well and find out what's going, working well, what doesn't work well. I still go to pastors' workshops and things to learn. I'm still reading books about pastoring. I've been doing it for 35 years, and I've got to still add to my knowledge. Come on. My wife and I, we've been married 42, coming up to 43 years, but we still go to conferences. We still read books about marriage. We still learn more about... Come on, somebody. That's why everybody who's married should sign up for the marriage event, not because we're doing it, but because you should always be learning. Add some more knowledge. You say, well, I already know. If you already know it all, that's dangerous. That's not growing. That's not moving forward. Add to your faith excellence. Do the best. If you want to be the best at your marriage, gain knowledge about marriage. You want to be the best in your finances, gain wisdom about and knowledge about finance. Oh. How many are following me? We build courage by building character. Goes on to say what? He goes on to say, add to your knowledge. He says temperance. Now, we don't use the word temperance. The word we use is self-control. Self-control. That means always learn to control our thoughts and our emotions. How many know it's the mind and the emotions that get the best of us? Why do we not live in victory? Why do we do things that are not mature? Because we followed our thoughts and our emotions and not the spirit. Self-control says, my thought says this. My thought says, I don't like them. My emotions say, I'm going to hurt them. Your spirit says, love them or pray for them. Come on. Do you see where maturity and victory comes in when you learn temperance, self-control? Yeah, I really would like to say this. I really would like to do this. But instead, (laughs) I'm going to let the spirit help me. Temperance. Self-control. Then he says, does temperance or self-control? Patience. Now, patience is similar to temperance. They work together. Or self-control. Patience is always learning to control our tongue and our actions. Patience is where we hold our tongue or stop honking the car horn in the garage when you're waiting for them to come. (laughs) Guilty. Been there, done that. Not good patience. Mm, That's one of my weaknesses right there. Patience. It's one of those character things I've got to work more on. Patience. Because we want to quick to... mm. And how many know quick isn't always best? You see, if we show 
self-control with our thoughts and our emotions. It will help us be patient with our tongue and with our actions. See how those work together? Then he says, add to patience, he says, godliness. What is godliness? It's godlike character. Or always wanting to do what God wants and what's right. Now, we don't always do it. Even when I've messed up, there have been times when I said, but I really thought I was doing the right thing. I really thought God wanted that. I messed up. Okay, God, forgive me. Let's move forward. But our heart should always be to do what God wants and what's right. Not what we want or what's easy. Maturity doesn't do and victory doesn't do what's easy. It does what's right. Maturity and victory doesn't do what I want. It does what God says I should do. Now, do we always perfect that? No, but we should always be striving for that. And add to godliness, kindness. You know, I think one of the most important words in the Bible is that word kindness. I think kindness could change houses, change families, change workplaces, change churches, change the world. Kindness. Always looking to find ways to help somebody or be nice to somebody. Can I tell you, thank you, please, excuse me, you're welcome, would change some houses. Change some marriages. Oh, come on. Thank you. Just because you're lovers and just because you've known each other a long time? Come on. Kindness. Add to kindness. It says charity or love. The word there is really agape love, which is the God kind of love, which is the sacrifice kind of love. And that means we should always be looking to sacrifice for the good of others. Jesus had agape love and told us to love the way he loved. And how did he love? He gave his life. Oh, I hate always having to be the one to give in. I hate always having to be the one to, to be the adult in the room. I always hate to be the one that, 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 that says, okay, it doesn't matter sacrificing for the good of others. How many know Jesus was right and he said, I'll still die? Wow. That's maturity. That's victory. Now, do you see how these qualities produce courage, produce victory, produce maturity, produce the calling that God wants? Here's how he ends it up. Look at verse, the last verse is, in this part, verses seven or seven, eight to ten. If you abound in these qualities, if you develop these kind of, this kind of character, you will not be barren or unfruitful. That means you'll prosper and you'll succeed. That means you'll have hope in the future. That means you'll have glory and virtue. That means you'll have victory and maturity. Do you see that? He says, if you lack these things, you'll be blind and forget you were purged from your sins. Or in other words, you won't even be able to see beyond where you are and never grow beyond where you are. And if you do these things, verse 10, you will make your calling, your calling to walk in victory and maturity and to be like Christ, and your election, your salvation, sure, strong. Stable, secure, and you will never fall. You'll be courageous, mature, and victorious. I close with this story. There's a story of a man who once bragged about cutting off the tail of a man-eating lion with a pocket knife. Someone asked him, why didn't you just cut off the head? And he said, someone already did that. <laughs> now, when I first read that story, I laughed like you did. And I thought, well, it doesn't take a whole lot of courage to cut off the tail of a man eating a lion if the head's already cut off. But then I thought of this. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah who has already cut off the head of the roaring lion who's the enemy of our soul. He's made it so easy. Oh, come on. 
He's made it so easy for us to be strong and courageous. All we have to do is cut off the tail of a dead lion. Oh, come on. You say, but pastor, it's hard. I know it's hard. I know generational changes. I know natural circumstances. I know spiritual conflicts. I know cultural crisis we're living in. I know uh, the internal challenges of fear and discouragement. We talked about those for five weeks. I know those are hard, but Jesus has already won the victory for us. And we just have to be strong and courageous and say, I got this. With God's help, I got this. With God's help, I can live victorious. With God's help, I can grow to maturity. With God's help, I can achieve my calling to be the best husband, wife, son, daughter, mother, father, papa, nana, whatever it is. With God's help, how I many know he's already did the hard work and the heavy lifting? He's called us now to walk in that victory and grow in that maturity like him. Bow your head with me. Close your eyes.